Okay, so I have to send thanks out to one of my uh, students. I can't quite remember your name. I apologize. They sent me, sent me this over, and I just basically turned it into a little checklist that you can come inside of here uh, and click around if you want to and just add an X or a little check mark. And this SEO audit checklist is basically here just to make sure that all of the you know small little things about your website are properly getting optimized. For example, you know, how many pages are indexed by Google, Bing, and Yahoo? Mainly you want to focus on Google. And I'm just going to go through a few of these things and kind of show you how to figure all of this out. So say we go into google.com. Uh, I'm not sure why I went into Gmail. We'll do that once more. Google.com. And I'm going to type in something like my website, uh, zach-miller.com. And what we're going to use here is we're going to look up site colon and then your website. And as you see here, I have 337 pages indexed. Now, what does that mean? It means there's 337 unique pages. If there's anything that's duplicated, anything that doesn't show relevant value to Google, um, they're not going to index those things. So that means I got quite a bit of content and value inside of my website that's being offered. Um, you know, obviously, if we were to compare this to something like Forbes, Dot com, we're going to see thousands or even millions of results. So obviously they're offering a buttload of basic uh, content that allows Google to say, hey, here's the reason why you should be indexed and ranking a lot of your terms. Uh, for me, I only have 337, definitely versing a million. I have a lot of ways to go, but I'm still ranking for a lot of cool terms, email marketing, sales funnel, sales funnel consultant, things like that. And we'll get into how those things are optimized. But this is the main way that you figure out the number that is indexed. So inside of here, we're just going to put uh, 327. I think it was 337. Sorry. Um, so does the site use query strings in the URL? Is that dynamically generated? What that basically means is when you come inside of here and you go to, say, my website, Zach Miller, is it saying, hey, uh, you know, test this, you know, test URL, that query string, that little thing right there, or maybe it's an equal sign or equal this, whatever that is, that's kind of what's known as a query string. And is it being dynamically generated? So you need to figure that out. The best way is you don't want it to be uh, have it query strings, but if it does, then you want it to be yes and yes, which means yes, they're both not only are there query strings, but it's being dynamically generated. So it's either uh, a no, no or a yes, yes. That's as simple as it gets. So for me, it's no, no. Um, and then are there any important elements of the site in flash? Now flash is a certain type of coding in which um, basically a video is played. It's a uh, moving animation, which has um, a, a lot of bad things in uh, behind it. And the main reason why is that flash websites used to be huge in the early days of the internet, but Google really wanted to move away from that because it is very resource heavy. So anything that's in flash, you need to move away from flash as quick as possible. Um, if you have videos, most of the time, if you're self hosting, sometimes uh, they can be in flash, but most of the times they're not. Anything that's in flash, anything that's a video, move it over, host it on YouTube. That's the best way to get rid of Flash and get rid of a lot of that um, coding that you don't need that loads on your own servers and takes up a lot of your bandwidth or your, uh, your, um, your ability to serve your content to your visitors. Next thing is, are there any important elements on the site in JavaScript? Again, JavaScript is just something that's, you know, uh, website.js so that dot js makes it a javascript and again a lot of important websites a lot of websites will have javascript because it creates this unique loadability and let me just show you one for example i'm going to go to uh, a client's website and kind of show you how js loads and anytime that you scroll down with something and it loads as you scroll down more and more that right there see it's so showing 18, 28, so it's showing you how it's loading because it's a larger website. Um, that right there automatically is JavaScript. As this goes down and starts loading, you see these things are loading as I scroll down, JavaScript. Again, I go down, JavaScript, JavaScript. 
all of this is JavaScript because it's loading on that uh, kind of as I go through. So does this have JavaScript? Yes, it does. Most websites will. It's not a bad thing. The one thing that you'll want to do is make sure that a lot of your JavaScript gets combined into one file. Uh, so there are tools that can do that for you. If you don't feel like doing that on your behalf, you can even outsource this. If you have a WordPress website, there's web uh, plugins for WordPress that will do this automatically for free for you. So it's very nice to have. Uh, so does your site use real text or HTML or pictures? Most will say yes and do. Uh, HTML is this coding right here. Let me quickly load it up. This is the source of all basic language on the internet and it looks like this. And um, even if you have something that's in CSS, it can be translated into HTML. So that's like the base language. So almost everything will say yes to that. Are any pages, there are any pages more than three clicks from the home page? That's a big one to keep in mind. The reason why is for conversion purposes. So if I'm going to say uh, Jack's website, what I want to do is I'm going to land on the home page and from the home page, am I three clicks away from being able to discover um, products that he sells or being able to even purchase those things? So number one, opting in, that should be one click away. So there it is. And there people can sign up just like that. So if we go into products, we click on products, there's your first click. So that's a main one that a lot of sites should have is a list of products because you want people to be able to instantly go to these things. Now here we have, um, you know, for example, the debt savior system. We may want to go inside of that. That's another click. So we're at two clicks. And now here we are. Someone goes through, they uh, sign up, they say yes to this. That's three clicks. And now we have someone that has opted in. So this is a real sales funnel. This is all different types of steps. But again, once you get there, um, it'll end up redirecting you. I apologize. It'll end up redirecting you and on your third click, basically signing up or opting into one of these pages, it'll redirect you right here. And this is what this is really all about is to get someone to the point where they can say, yes, you know, I want to buy something. I want to get something. I want to sign up, you know, let me in, let me buy it, all that. So once you have that three clicks away is the main secret sauce kind of to making sure people are able to easily send you and pay you money. Um, does the site use a CMS? If yes, which one? CMS is just short for content management system. And what that simply is going to go over is mainly your ability to manage your blog, your posts, your pages, your content, everything. To me, the best one has always been WordPress. It's highly developed, has a huge team, a lot of money behind it, a lot of investments, a lot of angel investors, a lot of funding, all of those things just scream that is going to be successful for years and years and years to come. Every other content management system I have always had trouble ranking with. Now it's not that I haven't ranked those websites. In fact, I think there's only one website content management system I have never ranked and that is a Wix website, W-I-X. Do not use them. Other than that, I've always been able to rank the websites, but the ones that rank the best are either ones that are built purely in WordPress or purely on HTML. So it's like right there that that shows you that probably WordPress is going to be your best solution and they're quick and easy to set up as websites. So do images have alt text? Alt text is, and let me quickly go into this kind of, um, We're going to imagine that we're back at uh, one of my client's websites. And as this is loading, we're going to go into the source code for this website. And this source code, we're just going to go to .jpg, look up one. Um, as we go in, here we go. We're just going to look for what's known as an alt tag. So the alt tag is going to look like this alt equals and as you can see some of these are missing alt tags here this one is not so the alt tag is that so you want to go through and make sure that every image that you use in here so obviously he needs um, 
a few things to correct inside of his website, which we'll probably do later on. We're more focused on building his website to convert better and make better sales rather than SEO rankings. But that being said, SEO rankings do still contribute to sales. Um, sometimes people will slide over these things and certain things like Firefox or Internet Explorer will show the alt tags. So it gives more information to the buyer on potentially what they're getting into. So yes and no for that, but I'm gonna say yes. Once you say yes, everything has an alt tag, that's great. Alt tags are normally going to be something where you're gonna to wanna to put in, uh, you know, it's gonna be image source equals, you know, your site.com image.jpg. Then it's going to come over, you're gonna have an alt, and your alt will be keyword one. And you're gonna to wanna to probably get a key list of keywords that you wanna rank for, things that, you know, are terms that relate to you. For me, it would be a sales funnel, being a sales funnel consultant, build a sales funnel for me, build my sales funnel, um, you know, sales funnel builders, sales funnel help, sales, all those things around those keywords and phrases, that's what I'm gonna put place in for my alt tags. Because those alt tags identify to Google, all right, if I were to go into Google Images, I know I'm spending a lot of time on this, guys, um, and I'm gonna be probably diving this into three different parts, and they're gonna be long, but this is how important every step is. So if I were to go in, type in Sales Funnel Consultant, um, and then I go over to Images, anything that has images that have the alt tag Sales Funnel Consultants, it's probably gonna show up in here. So as you can see that, that right there, that shows up. If I put in Zach Miller uh, sales, you know, something like that, or sales funnel, look at all these. There's all of my images that pop up regarding Zach Miller and sales. A lot of it has to do with sales funnel secrets. So again, alt tags are extremely important. Now, are there any 301 redirects? The difference between 301 and 302 is 301 means it's permanent. It's always gonna be like this. 302 means it's temporary, it may change, it probably will change. So Google, do not index this forever or don't ma make sure that you know you realize this is going to be changing. So if you have a 302, the um, redirect SEO still goes through, but it goes through in its terms of like 90%, 10%. But when you have a 301, it's 100% of the SEO juice to wherever you're pointing it. So when possible, if you're going to have something that redirects and you're gonna keep it like that, use a 301. Does the non-WW resolve to WW or vice versa, really? Um, for me, I like to have it short like this, as you see, uh, Jack McKegg. So instead of www.jackmckegg, it'll just revert back to Jack McKegg. And that's kind of the whole point that I want behind everything is that whenever someone puts in www, it reverts back to just the normal version of the website they have. If you have two different versions where it's coming in, it's saying, you know, www.zach-miller.com, and this doesn't resolve to a certain version of the website, um, then what's going to end up happening is you're going to have issues with that. And mine goes to HTTPS because that means people are purchasing through that URL. Um, but if it doesn't resolve, your SEO gets split up 50-50. So that's a very big thing. This is a huge, huge one that needs to be solved. And all you do is you just type in www. Um, let me even put one in where people don't buy on a website. So that way you can kind of see what I'm talking about. And just like that, it reverts back without the www. So if I copied and pasted this, obviously the HTTP stands. I put in the www again and it reverts back to here. So that's what I'm talking about. Um, again, you wanna make sure that it all funnels into one or the other. Doesn't matter which, it's whatever you prefer, but it has to funnel those two into one. Uh, are there any du duplicate content issues? A spider will help us identify that. For right now, we're gonna say no. How does the site handle 404 server responses? Best way to do that um, for anything is just to type in some web page that does not exist Usually you want it to either redirect to your homepage or to simply say, this page was not found. That's as simple as it is. And that's as simple as mine are. It's a 404 page not found, that simple. Here's all of the normal links that you probably want 
and it shows my home menu so that way people can get back to the home page so does it handle them it does do we have any broken links again our server and our crawl is going to let us know that shortly do the pages load quickly yes um, and the best way to find this out is to go to pingdom tools speed test search that online that's my personal favorite there is a hundred and one free tools out there that do the exact same thing the only reason that I do it like this is because I like to use the same servers over and over and it really gives me a nice look at everything so I'm going to choose a server that's nearby I have a US server so I don't want to go over all the way to Sweden most of my buyers are in America so I don't want to go over to Sweden so again all of that is really where you want to test in terms of latency getting back and forth between your server and where the person is so if you're in Sweden you're going all the way over all the way back all the way over all the way back from where my server is so I want to stay in the US or the country that I'm servicing and that's where I'm really trying to focus so do the pages load quickly I know that they will that's pretty simple do they have a strong internal link structure I certainly do an internal link structure if I can quickly quickly break that down for you before we move into the next lecture and this will probably be the last thing I'm also gonna switch over we're gonna find out if you have a robots and a sitemap with our crawlers and most crawlers will actually make these things for you so you you're done just like that so what a site structure will often be is you're going to have your home and then from there you're going to have your normal uh, what I call the five page website and that's gonna be things like about you know um, whoops contact uh, something like buy you know th there's gonna be all types of things so those are the main ones and then from there my favorite of course is the blog and from the blog you're gonna have thousands eventually you know years from now but uh, dozens to start and then hundreds a year or two from now and all of these are gonna be little blog posts and these blog posts all are going to have one unique thing in common and that is the fact that when they talk about similar topics they're going to interlink between each other kind of uh, like this and you don't want to link too many to too many places but when something is very relevant you'll want to obviously mention it and bring it back to you know say this is a, a really popular course right here or I'm sorry a really popular article that I talked about so this may be more I would consider more of a flagship and now I have a lot of my articles linking to this all over the place so this is that type of networking that makes your website have a strong interlinking about it um, you know other things that you might have would be an FAQ and uh, you know it really doesn't matter so the blog is really where a lot of the interlinking comes into play and then some of these blog posts obviously you're gonna want to sell um, your contact page is probably gonna link to your FAQ page because before people contact you you want them to learn obviously everything that's been answered before your about page may link to your FAQ and your contact your uh, you know home page is obviously the center of all of this your blog at certain times may link to the FAQ may link to the contact you know there's a tons of different ways that you would naturally interlink all of these pages so that way this interlinking looks just like it does a web and this web creates a strong sense of internal linking and the ability for people to find the pages that they need to find very quickly almost all of my pages inside of my website are probably anywhere from three clicks or less away now does that mean that you can get to every blog post instantly in three clicks not always some of the first blog posts I wrote are about four clicks away so you're gonna need to go to the home page then to the blog and then to you know that page that's stored on maybe you know 20 pages back and then click in to that blog so that's four clicks away but the strong internal linking makes sure that I'm not really too many clicks away from anything that I need to access within a website and that's the whole point 
of accessibility within your SEO 